Shabbat shalom to all of you. Um, we start the fourth book of the Humash, of the Torah. And, and this book uh, is called Bab Mikbar. In the Hebrew language, it's called in the wilderness or in the desert, depending how the translation uh, comes in different languages. Um, also, it's called the Humash Pekudim. It's the, the book of the accounting of the numbers. And this is a Latin, the Latin uh, denomination of the book is numbers, numeros. Uh, and this is what it tells us about many countings and numbers that you're going to see here. It's very interesting that lately, in the last 20 years, because of the cybernetics, because of the computer science, the many many things that have been done about studying the numbers that they are in this book. There are different rabbis, like a Rabbi Sasson, for example, who say that these numbers has an allegorical meaning, and all the numbers are allegorical, and, and it has a, a, a message inside the numbers. And you're going to see uh, in, in this book uh, different uh, typical numbers, like a multiple of seven, multiple of eight. The number 13 is very important. And also the prime numbers. And even mathematically speaking, they have found so many prime numbers here that is amazing. And today, in the, in the modern mathematics, prime numbers occupy a very important role in science. Then this is something that we look at the, at the Torah, you know, and we know that the Torah is not a scientific book, it is not an historical book, it is not a, a, a book of of science or is not a book of uh, bi biology or anything like that, but uh, it, when they talk about, you know, astrological book or astronomy book or anything like that, but uh, when they just, they are correct. They give you the, 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 the thing in clear way. <coughs> Even in the histero hist historicity, in the historical point of view, you know, sometimes, you know, the Torah does certain things to, because for, for them it's not as important the historical point of view, what is more important is the principle that is bringing to us. And always we need to understand this. I have talked to you from the beginning that biblical interpretation is a science and it's an art. And, and there is a lot of things in there that you need to to, to work carefully. But uh, one of the most difficult areas that are is to go back to the time that was written, that was given to us. Because their mentality, the way of seeing things, the way of uh, approaching things, even the idiomatic expression has been lost today. And then we interpret things like that. And sometimes we interpret it in the wrong way. What uh, sounds normal to us, maybe was not normal 4,000 years ago. And we need to be patient and we need to be uh, studious and searching other things. With the new discoveries in archaeology for civilizations prior to the giving of the Torah, we have been able to compare with the, with the Torah, with the, with the Ten Commandments and the, and the normative of the Torah, the, the, the laws given in it the principle given in it, and comparing with prior civilizations. And we have seen that there is not only many things that looks like similar, but that there is a great improvement or a changing of the, of the ideas that were in the wrong way. The, the Torah always is bringing you to the right understanding. This, this is what I, uh, uh, I want to tell you. Well, in this book, this book starts on the second month uh, of the second year that they are, uh, the ending of the first year and they start in the second year in the middle of the wilderness. They are in the, under the Har Sinai, you know, and they have already finishing to build the Mishkan, the Ohel Moed, the sanctuary, the Ten of Meeting that 
uh, the creator was going to talk to Moshe uh, uh, and, and give him more instructions. Interestingly enough, here say, by the ver uh, Adonai, El Moshe, Bamigvar Sinai, Beochel Moe, Be, Behale Hodesh, Hashenit, Beshana, Hasheni, Le Septem Meeres Mirraim, Lemor. Um, he is talking about two things. He's putting uh, in, uh, in, uh, in front of us. For one side, he's talking about the Bamigvar, he's talking about the wilderness, and from the other side, he's talking about the Ohel Moe. You know, already, already, uh, at this moment of the, of the reading of this book, already the thing of meeting was finished and already the creator was talking to Moshe Rabenu from the Ohel Moed, from the Ten of Meeting. Then why he mentioned uh, uh, Har Sinai, the, why he mentioned uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, he mentioned the, the wilderness in Sinai, because that's where was located the Ohel Moed at that time. The Mishkan was going to be a, a, a type of sanctuary, but it was a portable sanctuary. I mean, the, the sanctuary was going to go with the people of Israel and was the creator who was going to lead the people of Israel to different places in the wilderness. As a matter of re, uh, refreshing many things that has said before, uh, the idea uh, here we need to understand a Middle Eastern, Middle uh, Eastern mentality, philosophical mentality versus the philosophy understanding that we have, the philosophical understanding that we have today, that we call a Western civilization, we have, we call a, uh, a Greek civilization and things like that. And it's very important to look from the point of view of the language and the mentality and when you read this uh, book. For example, the Hebrew language is not a cognitive language. What I mean, what I say is not a cognitive language. The, the Hebrew language is not a language who define concepts. What it does is describe concepts, make a picture of them, okay? And then we, and say we and all of us and in this world that we come from the Western civilization, we are accustomed to a totally different type of language. The language that we are accustomed to is a cognitive language. You know, the Greek language, the Indo-European languages, that all of them, what they do is, uh, when you say something, it's because it goes behind a concept that has been defined. You understand the concept by definition, not by pictures, not by description. You understand it already by the concept. And what happens when you have a concept? A concept is more limited, you know? It is more, a, what I will say, uh, nuclear. And, and, and then it's like a written in, 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 in a rock and you cannot mold it, you can, it's not flexible, it's there. But when you describe a picture, your imagination starts flying. And you can see many different ways. This is the reason that they say that in the, in the Torah, you know, when they, uh, there are many, many traditions among, the, uh, among our people. Is the, the, for example, the, the, the Torah has 70 faces. The number 70 is completion on, and represent all humanity, you know, and then, uh, and they have 70 faces. That means that has, for every side that you see, every angle that you see, is going to give you an, a perspective. No, uh, you are going to have a very beautiful picture, and they're going to give you more clarity to certain things, certain ideas that the creator is defining. Even when the translation, the Targumin, from Hebrew to Greek, you know, uh, 200 years prior to the Common Era, the, was called the Septuagint, and there is a, there is a, a story about that, that there were 70 uh, uh, hahama, very smart 
men who translated and all the 70 were separated in each of the room. When they finished, all at the same time, they brought it together and was exactly the same translation by the, by the 70. This is uh, all our, our tradition that we have. But what, what it really means here about different understanding. From one side, I mentioned to you the, the Hebrew culture, the Middle East, is a holistic culture. Involves everybody, you know? And the, the revelation, the revelation goes from above down to men, no? Today, in the, in the, East, in the Western civilization, it's just the opposite, you know? Revelation comes from down up, you know? Uh, how the theologians tell the creator what he needed to say, you know? Uh, even in, 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 in Judaism, rabbinical Judaism, the rabbinical interpretation becomes more important uh, than the, uh, <coughs> the, the rabbinical interpretation becomes, uh, I would say, more important than the word itself. No? Then, we are adding, and it's exactly what the, the scriptures say, don't add or take anything from my word. And very important thing here, and more than you see the two pictures, is that the revelation comes from the creator to the individual. And this individual has what I want to make, I want to make a statement, makes a, it has a calling. And this calling, it is that it's going to make him or her special. And what he or her receive is going to be for the benefit of the whole community. The whole community. Okay. The main today in the Western civilization is just the opposite. It's more about the Greek mentality and the Aristotelian principles, rationalism. And this rationalism means that the, the, it is the wholeness, okay, the totality, goes to the individual. And, uh, and the, in, in other words, meanwhile, you receive the individual to give it to the community, it's the community who gives to the individual then everything ended on the atom. According to uh, Aristoteles, the atom, the indivisible part, and we become the center of the universe. Men become the center of the universe as unique, number one. And you're going to see in many places, number one, number one. For us, number one is the whole uh, community. No, as number one, the only one, the number one is the creator, and he's a had. And that's the number 13, by the way. Anyway, then you see, this is the differentiation about application and interpretation. And sometimes it becomes very difficult when you're trying to interpret it with your own mentality and trying to impose what I call it foreign concepts into the scripture. And I already talked to you about those terms, about the remembering theology, they call exegesis and eisegesis. You know, you will say, you're repeating to me already something that I know. I, because this is important. In this parasha, I'm going to give you a concept that is very interesting. And this is the basic idea. Each one of us, we are accounted. This is what is so important. Each one of us, we are accounted. Each one of us, we are very important to our creator. No? <laughs> Everyone has the opportunity to make a difference in this world. And you can make the difference in the positive way, or you can make the difference in the negative way. But you will do a difference. Your mere existence is going to make it different. Everybody who has been created, has cre been created. And now, what do we do with that? It's up to us. 
And this is why I mentioned to you before also the term Behirah of sheep, free will. Because each one of us, we're given a set of principles, and we decided what to do with them. At the end, we cannot blame others for our actions. As usually happens, we pass the buck to others. But totally the contrary. Today, we are learning that I am responsible for my own acts. And I cannot blame anybody else but myself for anything that I do that is wrong. You know? There are circumstances, there are situations, yes, who provoke that. But at the end, it's my response to those. And that's why it's so important to understand that a behirajo free will, the, 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 the determining point is responsibility. Are we responsible for our own actions? Well, why in the wilderness and why the Ohel Moed? Why the God is going to talk to the people of Israel after they had the Mishkan? What it means the wilderness in the sense of the time and where they were living? Let's do a little bit of uh, uh, history in, in, in the sense of these people. There has been only one year, only one year, away from the situation that they were before. You know? And what was the situation before? They were a part of Egypt. I want to put it in that way. They were part of Egypt. They were in the, in, in the economy, in the world of the Egyptians. By the way, in this census that we had, and this is the third census, prior census, they give us similar numbers, 600,000 to make a round numbers, you know, of men from 20 up. They mean that these men belong to the society in Egypt too. They were from Egypt. You know? And not all these men, not all these men were abused. Not all these men were uh, slaves. Some of them occupied positions for the government of Egypt. They had a very high position. And they, maybe they, they were the one that they, they uh, being Israelis themselves, you know, they, had, they, they needed to uh, lead or they needed to supervise their own people, you know? And because they were supervisors, they would occupy a better position. They had a better situation, like it does today. And today, if we talk about Israel as a people, if we go to, the, to, the, to Israel as the Medina Israel, as the government of Israel, and we go to the country itself, you're going to find very, very rich people, and you're going to find very, very, very poor people, and all in between. And there are some of them that they will love Israel, and some of them will like to fly from Israel, you know? Well, the situation was very similar when they left Egypt. Now, let me ask you this question. If you have been living very comfortable in, in Egypt, and you have been having a very good life in Egypt, even though you were Israeli, you know? And suddenly, you are thrown out from Egypt, from your beautiful house of a beautiful place uh, that we're enjoying certain uh, comfort, and you were sent to the middle of nowhere, the middle of the wilderness. Do you think that you will be happy? <laughs> totally the contrary. No air condition, no? <laughs> No running water, nothing, you know? And they were going to be upset. And what they will say? Over there, I was living better. And here, what I am doing this? Then not necessarily all Israel was together. There was no unity. And the Creator needed to work with them. Just immediately after they left, on the third month of the departure, they committed this horrible sin of the golden calf. And when we're trying to idealize Israel, you know, in Jeremiah Hanavi, the prophet Jeremiah, in chapter two, he is going to do a very idyllic 
uh, a story about the relationship that Israel had with, with the Creator at the beginning. Very idyllic, you know? But then at the end, he's going to say that they failed. But at the beginning, you know, you were my, my, uh, my bride, and you were sweet, and you were all those, those good things, you know? And, and I took you in the middle of nowhere, you didn't have anything, you depended on me, and you accept me, anything. Well, let's go back to reality. We know from the beginning, and this book, Numbers, Bamibar, this book is one of the most uh, scary books to me. Because it's going to show us exactly how we are as human beings. Even when we have the creator as, as a leader, as, as a covering, as a protector, we are going to see how we fail to him. No once, but over and over and over. And not only there's going to be a failure of, of the regular people, the worst part of the failure are going to be the leaders, the upper class, the top. They are going to be the, the greatest failures to the point that we are going to see that at the end that we fail so bad that all this generation is condemned not to get in at the promised land. They need to wait a second generation. What it means about being in the wilderness? Being in the wilderness means that there is nothing there, it's desolated. What happens when you don't have nothing to hold on to? That's when the Creator was teaching the people of Israel to learn to depend on Him to learn to trust on him. You remember that we were talking from Emet to Bitahong, from faith to trust. And he supplied them everything. They saw all the miracles that they could see. They saw that this beautiful, this beautiful theophany, if we can say in that way, that revelation of bringing the Torah down to us. Look, the Torah didn't go up, but came down to us. That was the word of God to us. And literally, we rejected, and then we needed to accept it again. We needed to do uh, this change. But I want to tell you something. Our Creator has a lot of patience, infinite patience. He is merciful. His rahamin, his mercy is great. And he worked with us step by step, little by little. You know, in spite of all our mistakes. Let me ask you this simple question to all of you right now. Is there anyone here among us that has never committed a mistake? Is there anyone here that has not done something wrong? Let me ask you this question. Has our Creator, blessed be His name, has rejected you? Totally the contrary. He's always waiting for you with open arms. You need, but uh, what do you need to do? He's not going to pull you. You need to go back to Him. That's the reason that the beautiful term Teshuvah, to return to him. And this idea, in this beginning, he counts the numbers. Let me ask you this simple question again. It is our creator all almighty and all omniscient? It's a rhetorical question, of course. Let me ask you this question again. That he needs to know how many are we. Does he know how to count? Why he needs the Israelites to be counted? If he knows exactly. You see, he's not doing for him. What he's doing for? For us. Everything the Creator asks us to do is not for him. It's for us. 
You know, it's very interesting that most of the theologians do you say, God requires this from you. God wants this from you. God, no. He doesn't want for him. He is asking you for your own good. For you to have a long life. For you to live better. You know, when he gave us the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, he was because he wants to make us miserable? Because he is like a, I call it, a party pooper? Totally the contrary. What he wanted was to give us life and life in abundance. And he's going to tell us over and over again the same thing. Then these were counted, and interestingly enough, he names names. He asked the people to name the leaders. Every tribe needed to name their leaders. I would challenge you only to check the, the, the names that were given there, all the leaders. You're going to see how much meaning, you know, and how many Shaddai, El Shaddai, God who nurtures us, who, 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 who is like a mother to us. That's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Because I told you, the, the, the scripture talks through pictures. And he, in, in, in this place, each one of the leaders, each one of the leaders, not only has a, a, a very special name, but a, has an important role. What the, the, the eternal God is telling us, you are counted. You are important. No one can go away. Everybody's counted. And there is a reason for your existence. And this time, his, we have now, it's very interesting, in Gematria, we can understand it in a better. From 12, we become 13. What is number 13? A had. The unity, the presence of God. You know, we added one extra tribe or well, there are two extra tribes and then uh, and substitute for one. Joseph becomes two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. And with this form the 12 tribes of Israel. And there is become an extra tribe. And this extra tribe, the tribe of Levi, the Leviim, they are going to be a special army, but I'm going to be an army not to do battle in the physical way. They're going to be an army to do a battle in the spiritual way. The rest of the tribes, they're going to do the battle in the physical realm. And the Levine are going to participate in the rituals, in the, uh, uh, in the worship, and the helping with the Ohel Moed with the Mishkan. And each one is giving a role. And when you mix the roles, you create chaos and you create in inner destruction. If you have been called to be the person that is going to bring the wood, and you say, you know what? I don't like to bring the wood. I'm going to bring the water. Okay? You have your own initiative. You know? And then, you ha the, the, all the who have been called to bring the water, start bringing the water. And then you have extra water. But no enough wood. And you create chaos. You create problems. Another picture that you can bring from this is don't try to be something that you have not been called to be. Don't try to be somebody else. Be proud, be happy who you are and be the best that you are. You know, there's nothing wrong with who you are. Our creator doesn't commit mistakes. And all of us, we have a role 
No, uh, this is the reason I mentioned to you so many times about Psalms 139. We not only we have been made a marvelous way, but uh, we have been given a very special role. What happens when you want to be somebody else that you are not? Not only you are going to be miserable, but are you going to be making miserable other people? And you create chaos. We see that, by the way, interestingly enough, later on. We are going to see uh, we, the Tang and Abiram and Korach in the rebellion against Moshe Rabenu and uh, Harun. Are you ready to be counted? Do you feel that you are being counted? Do you know that you're being counted? Look, uh, there are two areas, and I do not like to use too much about feelings. Because feelings is something about how you, uh, you, you, you have a sense of yourself, you know? But uh, it's, it's emotion. But I like to use about a little bit more practical, factual thing. Do you know that you're counted? Are you part of? Are you participating in? Or you are only a figure? Or are you part of us or you're not part? You know? Everybody is important. And everybody has a role. This is the reason that at the end in, the, in, in Nassau, you, we are going to see in the next uh, parasha, we are going to see the, many of the rabbis ask this question. You know, when, at, at the end of the inauguration of, of the Ohel Moed, the Mishkan, you know, every tribe is going to bring the korbans, the gift, the truma, no? the, uh, to, to the creator. Twelve tribes, every day a different tribe. And it's exactly the same. Every tribe brings exactly the same. Would it be easier to say, okay, the tribe of Judah, that is the first tribe that is going to bring the things, you know, and describe everything. And then after that, you say, all the rest of the tribe, every other day, they brought the same thing. And in the Torah, they repeat exactly the same thing, only they change the name of the tribe. And we ask them, say, and why they do that? Because our creator is demonstrating to us in a fact that each one of us is important. That each one of us we count. And you need to feel very, very special. Your personal experience, what you have gone through life, some of you, maybe you are starting your lives. Some of us, we are in the other side, no? But all of us, we have walked a very difficult path sometimes. Some of us, we have had very, very difficult experiences. Some of us, we have had a less difficult experiences. But I want to tell you a secret more difficult experience you have gone through, more you can contribute. Why? Because what you have gone through. You know, sometimes they say that the, the righteous men, you know, uh, sometimes they go through very difficult times. Why they go through difficult times? Because they need to constantly be coming back to the Creator, to be dependent. How many of us, we decided one time to walk away from the Creator, to do our own life? How many of us, we can relate to the prodigal son? This beautiful mashal, this beautiful parable of, uh, of our great Rabbi Yeshua gave it to us. 
you know, teaching us about the when you realize what you have done wrong, there is an opportunity to, to come back home. Are you coming back home? Or you are away from home? If you have been counted from the beginning, there is no reason why I cannot say present. Because you are here. Because you have been counted. You are important. Among all of us, there is no one more important than the other. The only difference is the role that we play. This week, we are going to celebrate Shavuot, a beautiful festival, the festival of the weeks. And this festival is so important, they call it the weeks, you know, it's a plural, Shavuot. And the, the question many rabbis ask, why the Torah was given in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness? Why the Torah was not given in Har Moria, in Jerusalem? The answer that, the, that we obtain is very simple. Because the Torah is not only for Israel, the Torah is universal. I was listening to a rabbi who say, and the Torah was given to us the Jews. You know, let me tell you, that is a totally wrong statement. And let me put it this way, and that is the problem when somebody takes position or something and plays a role that had not been given to them alone. The Torah was given to Israel and the people who were with Israel at that time. That was talking about the universality of the Torah. Didn't give it only to the Jews. The Jews is only a tribe. Today, everybody say, no. When we talk about you, the euphemistic way to say all Israel. But the Torah is clear. The Jews is the tribe of Judah. Now, let me put it this way. If you are a Jew, you belong to, to Israel. But not all Israel is a Jew. <laughs> I am getting you in certain things that make you think. When they receive the Torah in Har Sinai, was Israel, and around Israel, who was inside Israel? The Ereb Rab. And they receive it too. The Creator said, please get rid of the Ereb Rab before I talk to you. We are going to see in this very special book, especially in chapter 15 on the book of uh, Number, Bamibar. When the Creator very clear say, I have given you only one Torah. For you and for the foreigners. Only one Torah. And you cannot make discrimination with the others. Today, what I mean, we discriminate more than anybody else. This is the reason that the Creator put us in the middle of the wilderness. Because being in the middle of the wilderness, what happens when you are in nowhere and you don't have anything? There is a tradition in Judaism, and that's when I talk to you in Bayikra about Azazel, if you remember, that the wilderness represented in many ways the most wild thing. You know, the, uh, where the animals and there is nothing, there is no, nothing grows there, everything is desert, and uh, even you have problems to obtain water, and there are poisonous animals, ferocious animals. Everything goes against normal survival. And that really, you need to learn to survive. And you need to depend to each other. 
If you are by yourself in the middle of the desert, you die. You need to have community. You need to have people to support each other. And with the presence of God there, you cannot be destroyed. But also there is another beautiful point there. Where the, the atmosphere is the worst, where the situation is the worst, the, you know, that's it when we are closer to God than ever. You know, I have had many experiences. I has, you know, I have flown all over the world. And, and sometimes I have had times that the airplane went through difficult times. And one, one that I, the, a, a thunder or hit a, the engine of the, the engine. And, um, and let me tell you, it was scary. Okay? In, in that moment, I remember start thanking God for my life and everything. I remember all my life and everything else. And, and I was thanking him for my life. I saw in the middle of the airplane people that they were crying. They were scared to die. And they, they were so violently scared. Wow. And I was asking myself in this way, I don't want to die, but what these people are going through, what they have in their back that they are so scared to live this life. This is the time that you are forced in an indirect way to make it right. Maybe in a short time, but you're trying to make it right. And even if you do not know any God, you don't know the Creator, <laughs> you start talking to anybody. But when you have learned about to have a relationship with Him, blessed be His name, even in those moments, you had assurance of his presence more than ever. The wilderness is an scenario in which forced you to have a better relationship with the Creator. How many of us, when everything is going on very well, we have time to say thank you, God, for all the good things that you're doing for me. Sometimes, I, uh, oh, yeah, it's great. Thank you. Bye. When really we put ourselves in our knees and we pray hard, 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 when the things are not going right, that's the wilderness. And look at Israel were for 40 years in the wilderness. And the only one that passed to the promised land was the second generation. And only two men from the first generation were able to continue. An Israelite and a Goim. Oh, the rabbi don't like that. And I want to try to prove you that Caleb was a Jew of the Jews because he was a prince from the tribe of Judah. But Yehoshua and Caleb was one from Israel, another from Judah, and the, the representative of Judah was Egoim. Why the Creator do the, did that? To take away the pride of us Jews that we are pure land that were pure, pure blood, were blue blood, to tell us that he is in charge. And any time that you have pride of who you are, take it away. Because we are what we are because of him. Blessed be him. We are who we are because of what he has done for us. And we are responding to him. Let me go back to this simple question now. I finish. I'm repeating myself. 
Are you being counted? Do you know that you're being counted? Do you know that your presence is important? Are you making a difference? That is very important. Because I believe that if, if the Creator brought you to some place, it's because He wants to make a difference with you. You are important. You are not only a number, you are a person, you are an individual. You have a name. All of us will receive a name. Who differentiate us from the others. Today, everybody has a number, but uh, to us, it's a name. You know, that's in the Shoah. What, what they did to, to us, they put us a number to make us disappear. But we have a name. We are somebody. In a relationship here, are you being counted? If you are being counted, how are you being counted? Because you are positive, you are providing, you are making, you are helping, you are participating, you are part of, or you are only because you like to warm your chair. You know, to, to me, I always see and I receive with open arms the people that are excited about serving. Because when you serve, you are being counted. Do you remember I start talking about the two different mentalities? The Hebrew mentality is you exist for the reason of serving the community. The modern mentality it is, the community exists to serve me because I am the center of the universe. Two different views. Are you being a servant? Or you are being served? What are you? Because the Creator is talking to each one of us. Our Messiah Yeshua talked to us about that. That how important it is to give ourselves for our communities. And how important it is not to think in an egotistical way, but to, to look ourselves outside of ourselves. What are you good about? What is the thing that move you to do? What are the areas that you really have that you are unique? Because all of us, we are unique, by the way. What do you like to do? How would you like to serve? How would you like to be counted? Only as a number? or as a person. I recommend all of us to be counted as a person, not as a number. Because each one of us we has been made in a marvelous way. Blessed be the Lord. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>